Today we look at two of my favorite books in the Old Testament, and that is 1st and 2nd Maccabees. It tells the story of warriors who are zealous for the law of God, in particular for the temple of God and for the liturgy of God. And I'm putting 1st and 2nd Maccabees together in one video because 1st Maccabees gives us the historical rundown. 2nd Maccabees kind of repeats that historical story, but also gives us some more details and especially some theology. So today we'll look at the narrative of the Maccabean Revolt told in 1st and 2nd Maccabees. And then towards the end, I'll talk about the theology, especially as it's hashed out by 2nd Maccabees. So let's get started. So 1st Maccabees has 16 chapters, 2nd Maccabees has 15 chapters. And unlike 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees does not attempt to provide a complete account of the events. Instead, it covers only the period from the high priest Onias III and King Seleucus IV to the defeat of Nicanor in 161. Now, recall that the Judeans were exiled first by the Babylonians, who were conquered then by the Persians. And the Persians, as I've mentioned before, allowed the Judeans to return to Jerusalem. This is in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah to rebuild the temple, relearn the law of God, and rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Now, Alexander the Great, you've all heard of him, he conquered the known world, and he conquered the Persians, but he died at the age of 33. And so the Judeans were no longer under the Persian rule that was tolerant towards them. They were now under the Greek rule. Now, the Greeks were not tolerant like the Persians. The Greeks insisted that all Jews burn their scriptures, stop circumcising their children, work on the Sabbath day, stop all kosher eating, and fully assimilate into the Greek religion and the Greek culture. He also allowed women into the sacred precincts of the temple area, and he built a public gymnasium. And this was built where men exercised, and according to the Greek custom, they exercised in the nude. And this allowed the people of Israel and the Greeks to see who was circumcised and who was not circumcised. It was a way of monitoring the Jewish religion, whether they were following it or not. And some Jews happily went along with what the Greeks taught. They abandoned Yahweh, they abandoned the scriptures, and they began to worship idols. They began to eat pork sandwiches. Some of them even paid to have their foreskins corrected so they wouldn't look like they were circumcised. In other words, they completely apostatized. They completely rejected their Jewish identity. They became functionally Greeks. Now, in this context, a earnest and solid priest named Mattathias said, this is enough. They have destroyed our temple. They have offered unclean animals in the Holy of Holies. We are going to fight, and by God's power, we are going to win back the temple and reestablish the worship of God. So this holy priest, this holy man, Mattathias, is joined by his sons, and they create a militia and an army to fight the powerful Greeks. The sons of Mattathias were Judah Maccabeus, Jonathan Aphus, and Simon Thasi, and also Simon's son, John Hyrcanus. And they organized this army, and they were led after Mattathias died by the brother Judah Maccabee. Now, originally his name wasn't Maccabee. Maccabee means hammer. So Judah Maccabee means Judah the hammer, and this is in reference to his power in battle. He hammered the enemies. And that's where we get the name 1st and 2nd Maccabees. It's in reference to this great figure, Judah Maccabeus, Judah Maccabee the Hammer. Through the military efforts of Judah Maccabee and his armies, he recaptured Jerusalem, he drove out the Greeks, and he restored the temple there in Jerusalem. And this is the beginning of the Feast of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is the restoration, the reconsecration of of Jerusalem. You'll remember that Moses instituted six feasts. Another feast was added by Esther called Purim. And then this eighth feast is added by Judah Maccabee. It's commemorating their victory over the Greeks and the reestablishment of the temple and all things liturgical there in the precincts. And remember, the family of the Maccabees were themselves priests, so they take over as high priests in the years to come. Now, it's interesting. Judah Maccabee sought an alliance with the Roman Republic. This is in the 160s. He realized that they had beaten the Greeks once, 
but the Greeks would be back and they needed allies in the world. So they reached out to this new and growing Republic of Rome. Remember, Rome is not yet an empire. It's just the Roman Republic. And they sign a treaty. And if you read my book, The Eternal City, you'll see how I connect this with the coming of the kingdoms in Daniel and show how this alliance between the Jews and Rome eventually gives way to the context of the New Testament and the Roman Catholic Church. That's a talk for another day. Once this alliance is made between the Maccabees and Rome, they are relatively safe. He is succeeded by his brother Jonathan, who becomes the high priest, who also reestablishes the covenant or alliance with Rome. And Simon follows them, and he's also the high priest and the prince of Israel. Never before have we seen a high priest who's also the governor of Israel. Usually it's the Davidic king, who's the Messiah, and the high priest. Here, the high priests are functioning in a solo way. Simon and his successors form the Hasmonean dynasty, which will not always be considered valid by all of the Jews. And this begins the debate between the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Essenes. It all begins in this time period. And Simon leads the people generally in peace and prosperity, but he is murdered by agents of Ptolemy, son of Abubus, who had been named governor of the region by the Maccabean Greeks. And then he is succeeded by his son, John Hyrcanus. So that's the story of the Maccabees. Second Maccabees brings in some more details that are important to us. For example, Second Maccabees specifically teaches the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. This is in Second Maccabees 7.28. This is the doctrine that's taught by St. Thomas Aquinas, that all of creation is created out of nothing. In other words, God doesn't create creation out of himself. He doesn't have primordial matter that he works with. He creates out of nothing. He speaks his word, who is the Logos, and from nothing arises the cosmos. So we find that explicit in 2 Maccabees. That's important because Genesis does not explicitly state that. We find that here in 2 Maccabees. Also, there's an afterlife after death. It's kind of shady in the Old Testament what exactly happens to you after you die. 2 Maccabees explicitly states that there is a life after death. Also, we see prayers for the dead and sacrifices made for the dead because Judah Maccabee finds talismans, charms, on the bodies of his dead Jewish soldiers. And this, of course, is a sin. So he prays for them. He has sacrifices made for them so that they can go into heaven in the afterlife. And Catholics appeal to these verses, saying, yes, we pray for the dead. And yes, we have the sacrifice of the Mass said for the dead. We also learn that martyrs merit for the collective restoration of Israel. We read of the elder Eleazar and the mother and her seven sons who are violently murdered by the Greeks, but their death, their merits, help bring about the restoration. And even Hebrews chapter 11, verse 35, references this passage in 2 Maccabees when it says, quote, Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, that they might rise again to a better life, end quote. That's referring especially to the seven sons of the mother in 2 Maccabees 6 and 7. We also see the intercession of the saints. For example, in 2 Maccabees 15, we read, And Onias, that's the priest, Onias spoke, saying, This is the man who loves the brethren and prays much for the people and for the holy city, Jeremiah, the prophet of God. And then in an apparition, Jeremiah stretched out his right hand and gave to Judah a golden sword, and as he gave it, he addressed him thus, Take this holy sword, a gift from God, with which you will strike down your enemies. End quote. And then also in 2 Maccabees, we see explicit statements about the resurrection of the dead, that at the end of time, the dead will regain their bodies and be judged. So because of the passages regarding prayers for the dead, uh, Jeremiah, the prophet, praying for them and interacting for them, which looks like the Catholic practice of of praying and interacting with saints. Because of these reasons, Martin Luther especially did not like 2 Maccabees. And it's one of the main reasons why he removes these seven books, especially 2 Maccabees, from the Protestant Bible. So this was a trigger point for Martin Luther. What can we learn from this? I would encourage you, I encourage all Catholics, we must be warriors. Catholics, Christians have always seen themselves as warriors, as those who are fighting. It doesn't necessarily mean that we run out with swords and are slaying people, but with the sword of the Holy Spirit, with the Word of God, with Scripture, with the sacramentals, with the Mass, 
with the rosary, we are waging battle. Our truest enemies is Satan and his demons. Those are our enemies, and we defeat them through grace, through prayer, through martyrdom, as we see in this book, and through sacrifices. So as I always say on my podcast, be the Maccabee. Take on the Maccabean identity and be a warrior for Jesus Christ. Thanks for watching this video. Look forward to lessons to come. Thanks for being part of the new St. Thomas Institute, and God bless. Amen.